Good evening, this is Katie Gilmore with the Minnesota FAA Safety Team. Uh, welcome to National Drone Safety Awareness Week. We are on day three of our first week here. Um, let me see, I've got a quick question here. We are excited to have you, um, and we're also excited to have Todd Colton with um, Sentara Tom talk to us about agricultural drone uh, topics tonight. Um, I'm gonna post a poll right up front asking what your experience is with drones. It kind of helps us tailor the presentation and know who we're talking to. So the poll is, what is your experience with drones? Are you an experienced pilot? Are you just getting started? Or are you here to learn more? Um, looks like we've got one or two more folks joining us here as we get started. Uh, so if you've not been with us earlier this week, we talked about um, law enforcement on Monday. Uh, how law enforcement is using drones here in Minnesota. And then yesterday we talked about photography and videography. We will be posting all of these presentations on YouTube. So anybody who's attending will um, get that emailed link as well. Um, if you are here and you want FAA uh, wings credit, uh, you can send me an email. The email is in the invite um, and or comment in the chat and we'll make sure to grant you your access to or your credits for the wings program. Um, great, so our polls are in. We've got most people voting. 50% of our folks are here to learn more. We've got a significant portion beyond that just getting started and a couple of experienced pilots. So we've got a really good mix here. Um, we are excited to talk about drones today. Uh, as I mentioned, Drone Safety Awareness Week, this is the first week that the FAA, first year that the FAA is holding this Drone Safety Awareness Week. We're highlighting key sectors of the drone community. Oh, I forgot to cross off photography. We did that last night. So as I mentioned, tonight is agriculture, and then tomorrow we'll cover natural resources, and DNR will be the keynote speaker for that. And then on Friday night, we will talk about um, STEM uses with drones, and we'll have one of our local school districts presenting for that. Uh, we're also going to do a, a few slides about safety initiatives, and then we hope that you connect with other pilots in the area. Uh, this will culminate in a fly-in on Saturday here in Minnesota, so if you're local to us, we'd love to have you out at our drone field um, up uh, in North St. Paul. So we will meet at 10 o'clock at Century College to tour their Fab Lab, which is really impressive. If you've not been out to see a Fab Lab, you definitely should come by. Um, bring your drone at 11 o'clock. We're going to have a fly-in. We'll have a grill on site. Hopefully it's not too cold. Um, you, if you don't have a drone, come watch. Uh, come talk with folks. Talk about drones. And it is kid-friendly. I always bring my kids. I have two girls that are four years old and six years old. Um, and it will be safe for them as well. So with that, we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna play a video here that Todd and I recorded in advance. Um, I did get a note from somebody that it was a little bit skippy last night. Um, so uh, hopefully it works for everybody tonight. Um, you can ask a question in the questions if, uh, if it's not coming across well for you. So let me switch over my dashboard. I'm Todd Colton. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer at Centera. There's a bunch of different interesting problems to solve in agriculture. So one problem they might be trying to solve would be uh, in the spring, one thing that everybody's really interested in is something called stand counts. And stand counts is really a, a kind of an industry term for counting plants. How many plants uh, are standing? How many plants have grown out of the ground of the seeds that they planted? what percentage of them actually germinated and turned into real plants that they hope to grow over the season and eventually harvest as a crop. Maybe they might throw a hula hoop out if it's soybeans or they might take a tape measure or a pole and lay it on the ground along a, a row of corn plants. We'll count all the corn plants that came up out of the ground, kind of count the missing ones as well, and then just whip out a calculator and try to average that out over the, a huge field. So if they take three or maybe six counts over a 160 acre field which might be a typical average size field in minnesota uh you know they're just getting a few small measurements and trying to average that over a big field that might have um, waterways running through it or varying soil types or all sorts of different um, variables at play with a drone you can fly that over a field and get hundreds or even thousands of measurements in the same amount of time it would take you to walk out and manually count 
a, a farmer usually knows their field pretty well. Um, uh, sometimes they don't, but often it might, they've been farming it for years, maybe it's been in their family. Um, and so they might know where the low spots are that are typically will get water. But what they might not know is how much water they got this spring uh, or this last rain event that came through. And that rain event might've come through right when the plants were at a critical growing stage where it was really easy for them to drown out and die. So depending on how, how well the water drained or how big the pool was, it could be, you know, a fraction of an acre of loss, or it could be several acres of loss, or um, in significant events, it could be enough acreage that got damaged where it's meaningful from a um, insurance claim standpoint, so from a crop insurance, or it might be meaningful from a, them having to, them either having to or wanting to go back out and replant that area. Um, and it's, it's sometimes it's really on the bubble whether they're making that decision to spend the extra time and money to go take action or not. Um, and, and it could be important either way whether they, they make the right decision at the end of the season for how much yield they, they would recoup. The term that's used called NDVI, and that's a fancy term called, uh, that stands for um, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And that's a, a what, what that is, is it looks at different wavelengths of light. It specifically looks at near infrared light that the human eye can't see, and it looks at red light. And the, as that light reflects off of the ground and off of plants, uh, it turns out that you can get a really good indication of general um, plant health. And folks at NASA came up with this general formula using um, infrared satellites that were flying around the earth and looking at very large areas of land mass, land mass in North America. And they were using it to get broad area statistical information about how well is the crop doing in this region. So satellites are great for doing that on a very large scale, but they're not the best for doing it on a very local scale, individual fields, or even um, within a field, individual areas or, or areas that um, we might want to take, take um, action on. There's really small, lightweight cameras that will look at these different wavelengths of light and will be able to do a kind of a, a an localized NDVI uh, map on each individual field. And a grower doesn't have to wait for the satellite to come around. They can go out and fly that morning or that day. It uh, doesn't matter if it's cloudy or not cloudy. Uh, they can fly under the clouds and get that imagery. Um, and they can get their answer same day. The big question is you get this map and it shows you how healthy or unhealthy your, your crop is and where, you know, but so what or then what, right? So there's lots of there's lots of actual use cases and how you would how you would look at this. And and so one example would be um, either but they call it the like a 2020 rule where it has to be at least 20 acres of a field or 20% of the field, one or the other has to be satisfied in order to um, move forward. That's not the only type of insurance it is, but that's a common way to do it. So how do you measure that that 20% of the field or 20 acres? Um, if you were to go measure every little spot that got damaged, that would take forever and take way too long to actually add up all that answers. So there's a lot of estimating that happens right now. With a drone map, it's, you can do a, fly, a half hour flight, map the entire field, land, process the imagery into a perfectly geo-registered, accurate, geospatially accurate map. And then using this NDVI or other wavelengths of light, you can tell where the crop was actually damaged and where the crop is still growing healthily. And you can measure all those areas in an automated way using software, or it will automatically tally up all the answers and give you, at the end of it, this is how many acres uh, were actually impacted. And what that does is it, it reduces risk for the insurance company. It also gives the farmer or the grower um, a satisfied knowledge that they've actually got an accurate measurement. And both the insurance agent and the farmer are looking at the same piece of paper and the same map and the same data. Um, and it's, uh, it kind of helps everyone. The big, uh, in some ways, the holy grail of uh, of using drones and aerial imaging is to, to help manage um, nitrogen fertilizer and nitrogen application because that's one of the largest dollar value inputs that a grower is going to put into their field. So with nitrogen fertilizer, another aspect to it is obviously the environmental impact that nitrogen fertilizer has in terms of waterways and rivers. And you um, know that's that's well documented that the nitrogen levels are, are rising. There are certain times of the year they'll they'll rise just due to weather and runoff. And so it's in that sense, 
better managing the nitrogen application is a win-win both for growers and for the environment. So in general, the amount of fertilizer that goes down is, um, you know, the, the, the way a grower will look at that equation is they want to be sure that they, they're meeting that minimum threshold and applying the right, uh, at least the right amount um, over their entire field. And, and, and how do you measure that exact minimum threshold? Um, that's, you know, it, that can be tough because, because you're dealing with in-season variability. You're dealing with weather, you're dealing a lot with water and rain and how much of the in soil types and how much of the existing nitrogen uh, that's tied up in the soil um, is, is washed away or moved around the field throughout the season. So using aerial imaging you, and using, in, in particular in this case, multispectral imaging where you're looking at infrared light and other light that the human eye can't see, comparing that against the greens and reds, uh, you can get a, a much better indication of um, overall plant health and how that might be related to, to nitrogen fertilizer. So another really useful um, application of, of NDVI imagery, and especially from drones where it's low altitude and high resolution relative to satellites, would be later in the season when growers are looking at using fungicides and, and applying different types of inputs to help manage uh, crop health. And there's a lot of, um, uh, they'll apply it again in test strips and they'll try different rates or different applications at different parts of the field. Taking that and doing a before and after flight with an NDVI camera or looking at an infrared image of the before and after uh, really gives you a strong indication of the effects of that fungicide treatment. All right, so there's a use case that we're really excited about right now with uh, herbicide management and, and basically spraying for weeds in the field. Uh, so one technology that we've developed and that we're, is becoming very popular is using uh, drone imagery to take a, a make a map of your entire field and go and identify where the weeds are and where the weeds aren't. And uh, using machine learning, computer vision, and other technologies, and, and including multispectral imagery, we're able to identify what is rows of corn and what is rows of soybeans compared to what are naturally occurring weed. We're able to get highly accurate maps of the field identify each individual weed where it is, locate where it is in the field, and build a map that, that is down to, you know, we're talking just a couple inches of accuracy uh, for where the thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of weeds are throughout this field. We can take that map and build a spray prescription and load that into a precision sprayer. And they have the ability to turn the nozzles on and off depending on where they are in the field. So. By doing that, and uh, what we've shown over the last really two seasons we've been doing this, um, is that the we're able to, in, depending on the field, but a field where they would have sprayed the entire field with a blanket rate, spent thousands of dollars, many thousands of dollars on herbicide and treatment for that. We're able to build a map that will, um, we average about 70% savings. So 70% less herbicide will be applied and we've shown in general, it's equally effective. So, so this is a really good example of a quadcopter. It's, a, it's called the DJI Phantom 4. It's one of the most popular quadcopters flying out there today. Um, and it's called a quadcopter because it has four propellers and it flies like a helicopter, takes off and lands vertically and it can stop and hover in the field and it can fly kind of any direction it wants, just like a helicopter can. Um, and it has a nice camera on the front and companies like Centero will add additional cameras that ride along on the back and look at um, crop health. So this is a really great way to get into it and get started. They're super easy to use. Um, they, if you take your hands off the control sticks, it just stops and hovers and you can then take a breather and then decide what you want to do next. Once you start trying to think about cover and map really large areas, you might start thinking about what we call a fixed wing drone or just a normal airplane style drone. And this is a good example of that. This is a, a, a drone that we manufacture here at Centera called the PHX, specifically designed for aerial mapping and in particular aerial mapping over farm fields. Uh, it's got an electric motor in the front. It's obviously got wings, so it flies like an airplane. And one advantage of an airplane over a helicopter is it's a lot more efficient and typically flies a lot faster. So with this, you can fly and map a much larger field in less time. Um, and once you start thinking about how this will, technology will scale and how it will become more used more broadly on large farms, 
this is a better tool for that job. So um, I'd say in the future of agriculture, in particular the future of agricultural drones, we're going to start seeing um, more precision, uh, more precision in the drones and how they fly, but in particular more precision in the imagery they collect and exactly where those images are on the ground and more precision in the maps. That way that that precision can then map to the tractors and where they're driving and that nozzle by nozzle control, uh, spray control that we're talking about, or in some cases it might be planters that are planting different rows at different um, seed rates to kind of optimize the right amount or right density of plants in a certain area. Um, so that's one area where, where it's going. Another area where it's going and it lines up with the precision thing is um, actual spray drones and aerial applicators where they're, they're these are in this case are going to be larger drones that can carry a pretty good payload and it uh, might be a, a tank full of um, herbicide or insecticide uh, or, or different uh, different um, chemical that will be applied to the field and the amount of chemical that will be applied will be much more precise and kind of a feedback loop of the imagery that we collect and look at and, and using different information we get from that imagery being able to feed that back much more quickly into the action that gets taken in terms of um, whether we're, we're applying inputs or making in-season decisions we're finding uh, really all the time new and better use cases Great, thank you, Todd. Um, so we do have Todd here with us live, and you can type your questions down in the chat box um, at the bottom of your control panel. And uh, I just have two or three, uh, three or four slides about um, basic rules and regs for UAS, and then we will um, turn it over to Todd and he can answer your questions. So again, there should be a little um, area in the bottom of your control panel with chat on it, and or questions. Um, you can put them in the question section or the chat check section, and uh, we will answer your questions for you. Uh, so just a couple of um, slides here pertaining to FAA Safety Week. Oops, it says it's paused. Let me see what I can do here. Okay, we'll try it this way tonight. All right, so uh, the first thing, there are three things that you need to be a uh, licensed pilot, certified pilot here. Um, and this applies both to farmers, people taking photo doing photography, any kind of commercial activity with drones. So you'll need your remote pilot certificate. Um, there are a couple of rules um, in terms of getting that. You have to take a test, be 16 year old, years old. Um, there is, are a lot of great resources online for that. You can. Uh, ask us questions here uh, or find resources online. You also need to register your drones with the FAA. It's five bucks for three years, so it's pretty inexpensive. Um, and then you need to write that um, FAA number on the exterior of the aircraft. There are a couple of rules to follow. These are kind of the, the high level um, snapshot of the rules here. Stay below 400 feet. And the reason that 400 feet is really important is because manned aircraft are generally above 500 feet. Um, so that gives us a little safety pocket there. Your drone with the payload has to be less than 55 pounds. Don't fly over people. Don't fly out of line of sight, um, et cetera. So one thing that's important, and this applies both to recreational pilots now, and so those are hobbyists, as well as the uh, 107 certificated pilots, is this LANCE, um, L-A-A-N-C. It's an app, there's an app for that. So it's an app you can get on your phone that will give you um, real-time access to to look at all of the controlled airspace in your area. So this app will uh, pull up your location as well as whether or not there's controlled airspace where you're at. And if there is controlled airspace, you have to have authorization to fly there. Um, this is really important, especially as we come up to the 2020 elections, because in addition to um, the regular standing controlled airspace around major airports, there will also be these things called TFRs or temporary flight restrictions that pop up when um, the president or vice president or, or large events are in your area. So definitely download uh, one of the Lance apps. At the bottom right of this slide, fa.gov slash UAS, you can find more information on Lance and how to get access to that. We do um, host training events through Wings, through the, uh, the same website that you registered this with this um, uh, this presentation that goes a lot more in depth on how to use Lance. 
Uh, and one of the reasons we do that here in Minnesota, I know not everybody's from Minnesota, but here we have more than 370 airports in our state. Each one of those yellow circles um, represents an airport in the center. It's a lot. So we just want to keep manned aircraft safe, unmanned aircraft safe, and ensure that everybody gets home for dinner every night. Here in Minnesota, uh, we are a little bit different, so I'm switching over to MnDOT slides here. The Office of Aeronautics uh, does do state, regular, reg, state aviation regulation that dates back to the 20s, um, covering manned aircraft, and now it covers unmanned. It requires a uh, state commercial operator's license, tax registration, um, and in exchange, they do safety outreach for us. So, uh, and this is only for commercial operators. So if you're flying commercially as um, in agriculture or photography or mapping, again, you have to register your aircraft with the state. Your aircraft has to be insured. You have to have a commercial operator's license. And then they reiterate that you comply with FAA rules as well. And then another layer of regulations are local regulations. And again, these um, the FAA doesn't enforce these local regulations, so we're just doing this as information, but uh, MnDOT does keep a repository of known ordinances. Um, they're not always easy to find, and we don't have everything, so it is a pilot's responsibility, but uh, you'll find a link on MnDOT's site there, the dot.state.mn.us slash arrow. Um, and in the bottom right, there's a UAS uh, local UAS ordinances link. All right, so the last thing we want to talk about is uh, if you have not, go find your local flying club. There are a lot of them out there. Some of them are long-standing hobbyist groups like AMA. Um, there are new pop-up groups um, that fly first-person view, the little racing drones, if that's your thing. Um, people who fly the DJI quadcopters like Todd showed in the video, all kinds of different flying clubs. There's a lot of stuff still on Facebook. So uh, if you're a Facebook user, check it out there. Um, you can get more information on rules and regulations from the FAA.gov slash UAS. Uh, this, where this, web, or this webinar and others like it are hosted is at FAAsafety.gov through the WINGS program. And then we also have the MnDOT Aeronautics uh, link there as well. Um, you always have the local FAA office uh, as a, um, a resource, uh, and then those UAS helplines are also very useful. I've, I've actually called them, and they, uh, they do answer, so those are a resource for you as well. So with that, we'll get back to the good stuff. Um, let's get some of your Q&A here. Uh, so we've got a couple of questions, so you can go ahead and keep um, asking the questions in your questions bar or a chat, and we will get to you when we can. So, pull up Todd here. All right, Todd, are you there now? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, I got muted there. Um, Yep, I'm here. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions for you. Is is Santera looking at surveying hemp fields? Hemp fields have had issues with white mold and wet seasons. Sure. That... Um, Go ahead, I'll get to do that one first. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, to start off, um, thank you, Katie, for organizing uh, this event tonight, and really uh, the events are all happening this week. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think it's a great forum and a great opportunity. Uh, to, in terms of the uh, uh, viewer's question, about hemp field. So hemp is actually, I think it's the fastest growing um, crop or the fastest growing in terms of volume of, of um, acres in the US. Uh, so it's a real hot topic in the industry right now. And we're just sort of getting into it in terms of a new crop that we're looking at for aerial analytics um, and aerial imagery. And there's all sorts of real specific, you know, every crop has its own unique um, challenges and its own unique use cases and needs. Uh, corn is one thing, soybeans is another. You know, if you're talking small grains like wheat and barley, they've got their own their own things you're looking at. So, hemp obviously has another has its own um, specific use cases as well. So, things we're focusing on at the moment are are things like stand count um, in hemp, and there's a lot of interest in uh, male female identification and managing the the, the field and the re reproductive stages of uh, of the plants. Um, and then in, in terms of white mold or other other uh, diseases or challenges in the field, 
uh, there's not a, there's not nearly as much information or research out there on hemp as there is on more traditional commodity crops like corn and soybeans. So uh, it's definitely a new area that Centera is looking into, um, and we're looking forward to uh, uh, kind of learning more about that in the coming years. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, there is a growing, oh, also related to hemp, there is a growing problem with theft of hemp flowers. Um, could a survey be done of the flower to determine if you're missing some? That's a really interesting question. Um, and, and related to, uh, as, I, as I just mentioned, you know, we, we really are doing a lot with aerial imagery and analytics um, on a variety, of, variety of, of plants. So one that's real, real in terms of looking at flowers and detecting flowers on, on different plants, that's a area of interest uh, really in, in, in all crops. Um, one thing we've done a lot with up in Canada or in the Northern Plains would be canola. And uh, and looking at at their flowering rates on big large fields. Um, uh, another really popular thing is corn and uh, corn tassels. So using that similar technology, we we're kind of looking at uh, trying to adapt that to to um, hemp fields as well. But it's uh, it's super new, <laughs> so this so there isn't anything that we've done yet to date on that. But I, I'd expect based on how. Uh, we've been able to take our, our imaging technology from drones that we've done, uh, you know, really initially focusing on corn and soybeans, and it seems like every year we'll try to add another crop or two to the mix, leveraging the same type of imaging techniques and and image analysis techniques uh, to identify the different issues or the different um, features that we're looking for in the crop. Interesting. So it sounds like a lot of this, um, the imagery is one thing, but the back end is a whole second animal. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we've sort of been through an evolution in in drone technology over the years where, you know, just being able to fly with an autopilot on a small aircraft was um, one thing. And then being able to get really nice, small, lightweight cameras on there was another sort of breakthrough. Uh, and then, you know, and that's great for making YouTube videos or doing it for fun or, or going to the cabin or whatever it is you're, whatever it is you're, taking your video of, but you know, it's really what is the next step? And in terms of um, drone use in agriculture, uh, it, it, you know, the growers are not necessarily all that interested about the flying robot. They're really interested in the information or the insights that they can get after they've flown the, flown the, uh, the drone around. So, um, it, you know, for us, the big effort and the big focus is on the analytics and analyzing the imagery after the fact. Great, thank you. Okay, without getting salesy, <laughs> um, can you talk a little about the about the NDVI sensors that are available on the different aircraft and um, cost ratio of the aircraft to the sensor? That that sort of ballpark thing. Yeah, it's um, and the the cost ratio of the sensor to the aircraft is a thing that uh, in the aerospace industry has been, um, you know. Uh, it, as the aerospace industry moves forward, more and more of the money is in the sensors and the payloads on board every aircraft than, than necessarily in the basic airframe itself. So uh, today, it's typically depending on the drone, but an entry level drone might just for the airframe, you're maybe talking one to two thousand dollars and an entry level. Um, I mean, it, you know, there's a, there's a number of different multispectral and NDVI cameras on the market. And it's a little bit of a you get what you pay for, but there there definitely are real entry level products that are kind of in the five hundred dollar range. Uh, you, you know, once you get up to that two thousand to four thousand dollar range, you're starting to get into where it's a little bit more higher quality. And then um, you know above that, it's five thousand dollars or up. You're getting into more research grade sensors and things that universities or maybe corporate researchers would be interested in buying those type of sensors. So uh, typically. You know the ratio. You, you typically your sensor payload is probably worth about as much as your drone, if not double the price of your drone uh, when you're using it for agricultural purposes. Interesting. Great. Um, approximately, how long does it take to fly a field? And there's a lot of variables in that. But um, what would you look at for your day? 
Yeah, so, it, it, and for sure, it depends how big the field and all sorts of uh, what type of imagery you're trying to capture over the field. So, it, you know, typically you're going to spend at least 15, 20 minutes flying over a field um, uh, to get any, to get any sort of uh, decent type of type of information. But if you're talking about a much larger field and you're trying to get highly detailed information, maybe at low altitude where you're really zoomed in, uh, you know, you might spend over an hour sometimes flying that field and gathering the data. So it really, um, it, it, it really is, a, it depends answer. Uh, but the average, I would say the goal, uh, if you're out there trying to do this as a business um, and be effective as it is, you're probably, you wanna be spending less than an hour at each field um, and getting the, the right kind of information you can before moving on to the next one. Great, good to hear. Um, we're gonna switch gears uh, briefly and talk about hospitals, um, and then we'll come back to the question, these questions. This is as a tangential question. There's a question about um, almost all hospitals have heliports, and I'll take this one, Todd. Can you discuss issues with drones and heliports? Um, yeah, so heliports are definitely below 400 feet, and that's generally where drones are. Um, they are a you know a known item of conflict. We see helicopters um, often can be below that um, 400 feet. If it's mosquito control spraying for mosquitoes, if it's um, a, heli a medevac picking up um, a car accident victim, or transiting between hospitals, um, there are a lot of hospital or heliports in rural hospitals because it's a good fast way to get there. Um, so that is something that drone pilots really need to be aware of. Um, we try to do a lot of outreach with respect to heliports and helicopters because they are an area of concern. Um, so when you're when you're flying your drone, um, a lot of the uh, Lance applications I talked about on your smartphone will let you know, it will have an icon or a bubble around a hospital with a heliport. That is one way to help you know that there is something that could potentially be there. We highly encourage that you use a visual observer, especially if you're flying um, more than just, you know, right overhead um, at 100 feet. Uh, when you're flying these farm fields or you're out, you know, doing a construction site, you're in a rural or urban area, these helicopters can be anywhere. So definitely keep your eyes and ears open for them. We highly encourage visual observers and it's um, something to be aware of. That's another point is the agricultural sprayers. So you don't typically expect an airplane at 100 feet, um, but if you've not seen an ag sprayer, you're missing out because those guys <laughs> fly low and um, get into these uh, rural fields. We see them a lot too, and I do a lot of road construction work and we see them out all the time out in the rural areas. Um, they, you don't see them until they're above you. Same thing with the helicopters. So visual observers are really the, the key to keep everybody safe there. So we are going to pop back to you, Todd. I've got another question here about potatoes. So what types of unique issues are presented by potato crops? Wow. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So um, uh, potatoes is a real, real popular crop up in you know northern Minnesota, North Dakota, Idaho, obviously Montana, different areas. Um, and uh, potatoes were in, in some ways a surprise to us in that we initially developed a lot of imagery in, uh, and analytics techniques for corn and soybeans, and it's and potatoes being a, being a row crop and having real similar um, uh, you know, early emergence and, and, and growth patterns. Uh, a lot of the stand count analytics, uh, weed detection, and general plant health um, techniques really translated quite easily and quite quite readily into potatoes. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say the common use cases for drone imagery in potato are, you know, early season plant counts and, and plant population maps. Um, and then as they as they kind of mature, uh, you know, they, we're using the normalized difference vegetation index at NDVI imagery for just overall plant health. Um, and, and certainly there's certain diseases that, that affect uh, specifically potatoes or different plants like that. And, 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 and at different times of the year, uh, or different times of the growing season, some of those become, um, uh, you know, more important to be looking for that. And so it's a combination of, of just general visual imagery and that uh, multispectral NDVI imagery uh, to try to track and, and monitor the, um, uh, 
uh, some of those specific issues that may be happening in the field at different parts of the growing season. Great. Uh, and second part of that question, uh, we, we talked a little bit about it, uh, a little bit about it in the video, but how are drones helping farmers increase their profit margins with these crops? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'd say, and that's that's really what it's all about, right? I mean, the the economic motivation for this, it's using it as a tool in their business. So um, the you know the stand count issue, I've kind of mentioned that several times, but that that more and more growers are looking to that as a real early indication of how well is their field doing, you know, how, how many plants, how many seeds germinated and how many plants came up out of the ground, or when the plants are really small and you're still in the spring and you're going to have weather events, whether it's cold weather or wet weather, um, you know, are those, are those plants going to survive those early stages? And, you know, I, just, just, just getting a good handle on that and a, and a being able to look at your entire field and see those spots that would be in low spots or over the hill or past the rise where you wouldn't necessarily see it from the road or from your normal sort of scouting locations. Um, you know, that can be mean real dollars and cents, right? Uh, so, so if you've got an issue where 10% of your field is drowned out, uh, and maybe you thought it was 10% and, uh, but actually it was worse than that. It was 20% and whether you made, were able to make the insurance adjustment or whether your insurance adjuster was able to measure that accurately enough to, def to decide if you qualified for a, uh, an actual, um, claim or not, you know, that that's real money. Um, the, the examples of, of, uh, precision spraying and herbicide use. Uh, that's 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 real direct money, right? It's how how much how bit how much of that tank of uh, herbicide did you actually spray? You know how much are you paying the co-op to actually come out and do the spraying? Uh, you know you're, you're you're obviously you're paying a fee for them to come out, but then you're paying a per gallon rate or a per pound rate for what they're applying as well. So um, those are just you know real direct and immediate financial uh, benefits that can be found if you're using the the, the technology, right? Great. Sounds great. Uh, so that got us through our list of questions. If anybody else has a question, type it in now. Um, and I, you know, this, the agriculture, I grew up in Chicago. I didn't know there were still farms growing up, and now I live here in Minnesota and I've learned a lot. And I think it's just a really good indication of how much drones touch people. The fact that we've got an aerospace engineer who can now tell you about potatoes, you know, it's, it's a really interesting um, collision between all kinds of different industries and, um, it's just fascinating to see all of this develop. So uh, thank you, Todd, for spending your, your, your Wednesday night with us. I appreciate your time. Uh, this was great information. Uh, and I think we've exhausted our questions. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Uh, we will be, we've got one more question, so I'll get to you in just a second. Um, we will be back again tomorrow night to talk with the Department of Natural Resources about what they're doing with drones. Um, and. Uh, Again, if you want credit for this uh, via Wings, uh, just let me know in the comments. I've got yours, Rebecca, and then we will make sure you've got it. So one last question here. Um, oh, Robert's making a comment about he's considered building long-term persistence drones for security duty. Yeah, there, there again, there's so many uses for drones, drones for good, right? It's the hashtag. We love um, talking about these different uses and we encourage you to go out in your community and talk about how the drones are being used for you as well. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time, and you have a wonderful evening. Hopefully, we'll see you back tomorrow night.